guys. I just don't think it looks like a Lamborghini. I can't believe Marcello Gandini had anything to do with it. I've never owned one. I've never wanted one. And I feel sad about that because really we should. What if I stayed in that lane for the duration of my journey? I'd have shot you. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Collecting Addicts podcast, episode number 47. We've made it through pretty much a calendar year, it's 2024, none of us thought we'd be here, but we still are. To kick off this year's podding, how about this for a topic? Because it's so open to interpretation, I don't know where to begin, but I will begin with Neil Clifford, who posted it. Best car games. What do you mean by it? And what are your favourites? Well, I, I, I did. I did. Uh, I have a secret. I have a secret game that I haven't actually shared with anyone, including my wife. And it sounds a little uh, macabre, really, but I, it's not. If I've got a piece of dirt, or even more annoying, a stone chip on my windscreen. I pretend it's a gun. <laughs> gun sight. And, but not, not in a sort of modern day drive-by shooting, let's just kill people for the sake of it type of shooting. I pretend I'm a Spitfire pilot. Of course. Of course. So, you know, you know when you're driving along, well, obviously, if you're in a Spitfire, I've never done this, you obviously have to shoot ahead or you have to, you have to judge where the plane is going. So I, I do that for cars or, in fact, people. When I'm driving yeah. along. So I actually getting a stone chip on my windscreen is often quite joyful because it means I now have a gun in my 991 Turbo S, which I can then pretend to shoot people. <laughs> Do you have that, windscreen that's a, that's insurance? A, that's a, I, I know I've never used that. So do you keep do you keep stone chips on the windscreen longer than yes. you need to? So you've got a gun sight. Yes. I do. <laughs> So I've is never, it actually is it actually, a, actually is it actually a real windscreen. wrench for you to get a screen replaced? The only the only windscreen I've replaced is a G wagon, which I think we had about three of the bloody things because it's so vertical right. that it's very easy to break. So I did I did use the um, windscreen insurance on the G wagon. Apart from that, oh, he's gone. Get a photo of it. That's a good one. Get yeah. a photo of it. And I, I actually, I'm, on my A10. He's back. He's back. Damn. Okay. So do you find yourself, Neil, when you're doing that, do you find yourself, because I, I totally get that, and that, the idea of thinking about how much lead to give yeah. the car or the pedestrian, do you find yourself, because I know I would, sort of steering the car like you would your Spitfire, sort of banking it a bit and so forth, just so you've got the right amount of lead? Just to well, confirm I, for audience that will have bad audio connection, Chris Cooper said banking, okay? Good. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I. I don't find it that enjoyable shooting the actual pedestrians. It's more about people that are driving along in the middle lane. Yeah, it's those types of people, or the worst ones, the undertakers, oh, the people oh. that you know. You're going along at maybe a slightly notch over the speed limit, and along comes a four D number plate Mercedes Black E Class and just zooms up the inside lane and sort of swerves in between lots of cars. It's those people I like to shoot. Do you be make a dagger, 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 dagger noise when you're doing it? No, it's silent. Yeah, be I'd slightly careful, because that might be Chris Harris or I nipping up the inside of you, especially no, if you're no passing around in the under, wrong lane. No, no also, and also, also that, that's t you're just, so you're saying that people that drive mercedes Benzes E-classes are look like they're Turkish or Iranian? No, right, only if they're undertaking. Uh, okay. The undertaking uh, element. How long? Here's there. a question for you. How long, if you move from the outside lane, or you if you move to an inner lane, how long do you need to go for in that lane before it stops being undertaking? So if, so if I if you were in the outside lane and I was and I pulled into the inside lane, went past you, but I stayed in that lane for three miles, is that still undertaking? No, that's just yeah. uh, that's still undertaking. Is it? Yes. Yeah. What and if I I'd, stayed in that lane for the duration of my journey? I'd have shot you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do what you do, monkey. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, so here's a question for you, Chris Cooper. 
Sorry, uh, sorry, no, Clifford. Um, how much would you pay to have a real gun fitted to a car? Oh, uh, the problem just is five blanks. Just five blanks. Okay, all right, blanks. Um, five grand. Oh, I like <laughs> it. I can and remember what... we, when we filmed uh, on uh, Top Gear. We filmed a thing with that crazy Aston continuation DB5 they did with all the bombs. Yes, yes. A couple of million quid. And Paddy was the one that did the review on it. And it was it was done beautifully by Aston Martin's special works project place. It was such a clever thing. Obviously, you couldn't road register it, which meant it made it, it was virtually pointless. But it had the rotating number plates. It, it was an absolute copy of the car from the film. But there was a sequence we did at the end where I think Fred, bless him, was dressed as Jaws. I was dressed as Knickknack. And uh, and and we were being chased by Paddy in this in this Aston. When we saw the onboards, and this is I think this is universal. Paddy was Paddy had a a fake gun situ situation coming out of the front of the overriders of the of the of the Aston Martin, and he's convinced they're real guns. When you watch the onboard, he's going. He can hear him. He's going. Dak -a -dak -a -dak -a. It's like they're real guns. Like, even yeah, if you're 50, really even, even if you're fifty years old. And they're fake. You convince yourself they're real. Yes, hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. I would definitely absolutely convinced they're real. He was. Um, okay, so that so you've answered that question in a way I totally didn't expect you to. So what I've written here, Mario Kart. I need to go back to the drawing board and work out what you actually meant by best car game. <laughs> yeah. Manish, what's your favourite car game? But when I when I was a kid, my father used to hate us doing anything like it or singing in the back of a car. So he used to bribe us. My sister and me by giving us, I think it was a it was a pound, which in 1974 was like giving a six-year-old 10 quid. Ten so basically, uh, it, it was lots and lots of sweets. But I did have a very good friend, and we used to play Neil Clifford's favorite game in the back of a car, which is Top Trumps. There is no better way of getting two young boys to shut the fuck up in the back of the car than <laughs> five decks. But very so uh, top Trump supercars is absolutely it, yeah. it, it was the way to play it, wasn't it? Was that it? a Mercedes SSK on there? Yeah. And an SLC, yeah. The yeah. best set is the one from the late 70s. It's got the BB and the Ferrari pin in, in the pack. Just brilliant. Yeah, I, I think, think that was that, supercars. I think it's that one. It's that yeah, it's the one that's that one. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. The Bricklin. It's got the Sbarrow in it. Yeah. Well, that was I mean, that, honestly, it's it, the it, Bricklin. It invented that's what it was, the Bricklin. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever invented Top Trumps. You know. Okay, uh, I've got Top Trumps down, so that's one of mine gone. Uh, Chris Cooper. Um, so I didn't think it was games. I did think it was games. I think it was things you do with your car, which is a bit of a game. So I think it's a really cool game, particularly in like stop and start traffic on the motorway, to play that game where you never stop. Oh, that's good. You never stop. And you sort of like, you look. it's quite good. You look ahead and you think, Where's the traffic, that ebb and flow? It's a, a sort of, I could do a little side essay here on the sort of the dynamics of queuing theory as to why traffic actually stops when the volume and sort of, there's a graph in here, one of our graphs and probably some differential calculus. We'll leave that to another occasion because it looks like <laughs> monkey's Wi-Fi is frozen, but it hasn't. <laughs> He's just cross. I thought you couldn't so, do maths, Chris. No, I can't do maths. That's much what does differential do. calculus so sort of mean? Judging, <laughs> judging that, okay, it looked, there's some red lights, they've all stopped. Yes. People in the next lane are going up and going, doo, 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 and everyone's yeah, You don't need differential calculus. I mean, that's, yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. So you think, I'm just going to ease off the gas. I'm going to roll up. It looks like I might hit them, but I can see and I know that the traffic in front of the car that's not in front of me is moving. And then for the person behind me, I've given them a joyous, uninterrupted little waft through the traffic. So not stopping the motorway is quite a good game. That's a good game. You're not, but you're not that Don't wanker that nips. Very wound not, up you're not that wanker you. that nips between lanes of station, almost stationary traffic. Are no, you? that's cheating. Good. No, no, no. good. That's cheating. Because that's the kind of thing Abel would do. Yeah, I would never do that. In fact, I would, I would never, ever, ever do that. No, I wouldn't ever. No, do do that. people get annoyed behind you when you do that, though, Chris? Because they think. No, I think quite the opposite. I think okay, I, quite on. the opposite because they suddenly realise. Do you know what? This lane seems to be quite smooth running. I've no idea how and why. So the other game I like I've playing... Got stop, I've got to stop you. I've got one key question to ask you. So at that point, you are effectively managing the time of the people behind you. You're saying to them, I'm going to give you a smooth ride. You don't need to accelerate or brake as frequently. But you're doing that based on the fact you can control the distance you have to the car in front. So what yeah. happens when 
to use a name, Chris Harris pops out in front of you and, and reduces that distance by half. And suddenly you can't provide your followers with such a smooth run. Um, so the too. good news in that case is that you can usually spot the body language. Nothing we <laughs> talk about at some point other time is what do we learn from the body language of other road users? And having been in the passenger seat of Harris C and various borrowed motor cars from kind and generous press departments of premium high-end and sports car manufacturers, I know a lot about body language. <laughs> so you can tell the bloke, you can see him in, in the, the near side mirror, you think, here comes a, let's just call him a Harris. Here comes a Harris. That's and you can unfair. see they're sniffing, they're mm. sniffing that little gap in front. Although so I, do remember, you I can, do remember once you turned around to me and saying, why don't you drive our race car like that? Which I, I, might thought, have done which that I thought was unfair. I so, might have done sorry, that, move, move on, move so on. So the other way, the other quite good game, I've got a couple, I'll just, I'll limit it one because I've got a lot to get through. Um, that game you play where you can increase and watch the increases in average speed and average MPG. Yeah, yep. good. I love that game. I love that game. I thought you didn't like numbers. I just am confused. It's just, I sent you, I, I won't say what the numbers are, but I, a while ago I sent to the group a photograph that my wife took, because she was in the passenger seat, obvs, <laughs> of the little trip computer thing saying average speed and average MPG. And there were two quite nice round numbers. Uh, hmm. uh, a bit of symmetry in there, which we know is important. And that's a, just a, such a satisfying game to sort of drive in that way where you see the average speed creeping up. And in Landover products, it gives you a little, little on the dash, and a Jaguar as well, it gives you a little green-coloured throttle pedal to yeah. say, you're driving well. So that green-coloured throttle pedal and uh, watching the average MPG and the average speed going, oh, that's a satisfying game. Those okay. are colours. I, I love, love those games. Let's, um, let's move to Edward. Mm -hmm. That's a scary game to play, Chris, in a G-Wagon to see how low you can get the consumption <laughs> number when you floor the throttle. That yeah. is the inverse. <laughs> so what's, the, what's the one car maker that doesn't provide an MPG readout? Ooh. Fuck. Tell us, Christopher. Ferrari. Ferrari. Ah. Mm. There is no MPG at all on any of their cars. Mm. They couldn't give a... Well, even, no, in the at all. I'm surely there must be in the digital. Uh, no, not at all? Nope, there is I've no never MPG. Seen it. No one wants yeah. to know they're doing four MPG in their A12. Yeah, that's true. No difference. Right, go on then. Edward? Well, I didn't leave London over Christmas. I didn't leave the M25. And obviously, having three children around Christmas, it's you know it's quite an intense time. So the game I ch decided to teach them was uh, Catch the Cigarette Lighter. Um <laughs> <laughs> you mean the hot cigarette lighter? Yeah. No, I'm, 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 I'm joking. That's only carrying on from the silly things I've done in cars. <laughs> um, the the game I used to love playing, and I think I've said this one before in um, in France, driving through France as a as a young boy, and I still do it now. Is there are 95 different department numbers on? the number plates in France. Yes. And seeing if I can get from uh, Calais to Megev and how many of those numbers you can see on the motorway. It's actually a lot harder than it used to be because a lot of the French choose not to use the toll it, roads they? and they use the A road. Is it the are they, is it the A roads, the National Highway? Route National. N roads. Yeah. The route, N roads. Yeah. And the route National. Yeah. So it's a, it's a far harder game to play nowadays. Are you writing these down? Because if there are 95 departments. No, as, as kids, we used to leave either London or Megev and we used to write 1 to 95 yeah, on the right. paper. We're literally and, writing them down. And, and, no, no, no. Up. We'd put 1 to 95 and then we'd put circles Pickle. around them yeah. as, oh, as, as, we, as we go through them yeah was wow. that when you had a really big rear headrest in the car and you could just put hold a piece of paper against the rear headrest and just sort of draw circles around it that that sort of thing yeah yeah i can imagine <laughs> and, and in the in the summer in the maybach laundelay we used to take the roof down <laughs> <laughs> very good very good he's um, not kidding is he <laughs> no, no, he really isn't. Uh, so I, 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 because I thought this is open to interpretation. I, I sort of a bit like a scrum under the post, ten yards out. I split my backs. So I've got, um, I've got uh, top trumps. I've got Gran Turismo first edition Mario Kart to answer the technical question: best car games, as in games of cars. Yeah, yeah. But in the car, 
I think if you listen to Cavan Pressure again, Yellow Car is is a is a is an is a brilliant game. Arthur's explanation of Yellow Car when someone says when do it end, and there's this lovely pause, and he goes, "It never ends." <laughs> I, I love that Yellow Car. Yeah. Um, what is it? Actually, you got to see the Yellow Car first. You see, yeah, you see Yellow Car. You, you just yeah. say Yellow Car. That's it. It's like Panda, Panda in Sicily. Yeah, exactly that. So I yeah. think, but but actually, as I sort of ruminated on this when I was writing them down earlier, I thought to myself. The car games is almost a place at which you can define whether you're an addict or not. Because an addict doesn't need games. Because an addict is so fascinated by the car environment around them that you're always looking. You know, I'm always I almost don't have time to have car games. Because I'm I'm looking at the thing behind me thinking, if I smash the throttle now, is he going to be quicker than me? Is he got better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Does my internal data computer tell me he's got a really yeah. good 50 to 70 time inside there? What's that up the inside? Why has that got that exhaust on it? That's the wrong badge for that trim. You know, I'm you're actually always busy. You're always playing games yeah. in your head, aren't you? And so I, I I think that's what I'm always doing. But I, the one I do that is perpetual for me is I'm either matching range against distance both in my head and on the computer. Yeah. I'm also, I play a game, I use Apple Maps the whole time because I, I have done for years, but I'm always trying to work out whether I can, whether my calculated time of arrival is more accurate than the computer. Yes. Love and, I, and, and, I, and I know when I'm guilty, sometimes if I get it wrong, I'll adjust my speed at the end of the journey to get it closer to my ETA. Yeah, oh, I've God. never done that. Racing the nav is racing the nav. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, those are mine. But yeah, I, okay. I, I think I think the real addict is always so busy in the car, and actually, that's why sometimes, even though we love having passengers, the biggest drawback is having people in the car that fecking talk and want to engage. Oh. And I think to myself. I want to work out whether that's got that that's a twin turbo V8 Merc or it's got the normally aspirated engine in it. I don't want to listen to your Ooh, bloody yeah. stories about your life. I want to yeah. work, with, you know, that's also he's got a different tread pattern on the right rear tire there. Or do I do I say to him, you want to sort those out, mate? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That is those are great games. Turn your I, fog I, lights off. Yeah. <laughs> turn your fog lights off. <laughs> now this is a really good one. What's your favorite shit car? I ought to. I really ought to go with this. Is this is not a car that you've owned? Just favourite shit car. It could be a car you've owned. So, given that only one of us has owned much, several six series convertibles, I should go to Chris Cooper first. <laughs> <laughs> you say that. I, I know. I always say this, but you you've got it in your head that somehow I'm embarrassed or ashamed to have owned back to back six. And, and the the truth is, I'm not. And I said, I said to you as a weekend. I saw sometime, it must have been just before New Year's Eve. We were recording this on Tuesday, 2nd of, is it Tuesday today, 2nd of January? Yeah, it is, yeah. So it must have been Friday or Saturday. I happened to drive past a sort of reasonably unmolested six series convertible. You can always spot unmolested six Which series. gen? Which gen? Uh, gen one. Yeah. Which, which has got six, six, four, five. Yeah. yeah. Which had a slightly nicer engine, if I'm it honest. Did. It did. Slightly nicer engine. Made a slightly better noise. And you can always tell an unmolested one because it will have the standard wheels. That is the first sign of a molested, actually lots of cars, but certainly six series. So I lost the rest of the day looking for elegant and beautiful and enjoyable six series. Even though they were I, have, a bit... I have a photograph of you sitting on the quayside at Dover in a, in one of those cars with, Calais, a young man, with a young man next to me. And I, I'm not, I don't think it looks good. Uh, it was Calais. <laughs> you remember that? It was Calais because there'd been a fire one of the two fires they ever had in the Eurotunnel. Yeah. And we had to drive back early from a race, a VLN race, because one of the diesel cars had dropped diesel uh, just after Miss Hit Miss. Yeah. And because it was diesel, it couldn't clean off. So to persuade us that it was really slippery, they, they, got us all back into, they got us all back into the press room and they showed us some cameras from the circuit CCTV camera of one of those little municipal little sweeper Hoover brusher machines. There's about 12 miles an hour on the lock stops around that tight left hander after me. So it's that slippery. So we all went home early. What's the name of the tight left hander at the bottom? Verzeifen. Verzeifen. One nil. Okay, you oh, got that one. So, 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 uh, so, so shit car. So, yeah. I have my brothers have one of these, and if you looked at its individual features individually, you'd think it's a bit of a shit car. Eighty-four horsepower, I think, 
plastic tailgate, a dashboard made of stuff that was used to be plastic before it went downhill. Citroen AX GT is not a shit car. Exactly, exactly. That's why it's my favourite shit car. No, <laughs> it's a great car. It's a great car. But if you looked at it in isolation and decompose it, you'd think, probably weren't very good, but what a car. I think I did my driving lessons in one of those. It was not an 84 AX GT, horsepower. No, no, an AX. And it's an, an AX. AX. 84 I'll horsepower. Tell you what, I, need to, I, need to, I need time to get over that. I need a bit of therapy. Uh, uh, Manish, what's your favourite shit car? Well, <clears throat> this thing should, in theory, um, given its pedigree and the guy who designed it, be just, just a godlike chariot. But it's a collection of straight lines. It looks, to some extent, from the back as if it should definitely be a hatchback but actually it's got a boot. It predates pop-up headlights. And um, at the front, they look hooded, except when you turn the lights on, the hoods fall down instead of lift up. Oh, I know what this is. And it's a Lamborghini Harama. Yeah. Oh, um, it's a pretty car. Yes, well, yes. See, that's the thing, Neil. I, people are very Marmite about the Harama. And I've, I've actually, I've never driven one, but I've, I've been <clears> in. And... Um, it's just squat and it's just wide and it's just low. And I think it looks, I think it looks like it could be a Vauxhall or a Ford. It really, really, really strange looking car. But you turn the engine on, it's a bloody front engined Lamborghini, isn't it? I think it's about yeah. a foot shorter than your Espada, isn't it? It's 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 a, a little bit wider, I think it's a little bit shorter. You can just about get into the back seats. I just don't think it looks like a Lamborghini. I can't believe Marcello Gandini had anything to do with it. But there is something magnificent about its shittiness or shitty about its magnificence. <laughs> I've just it's looked so at it. It looks like a, a 365 GTC has run into the back of an Alfa Montreal. Something like that, exactly. The hooded eyes. He's pleased with that Alpha description, Montreal. and rightly so. He's pleased with that. And yeah. that almost redeems you from that ludicrous outburst about the AX GT. Um, Edward Lovett. Well, I've written two down here, and I, I hope I don't offend anyone, but they're our favourite shitters' cars. So, sorry, sorry, uh, stop there. He, did Edward Lovett just say he hopes he doesn't offend anyone? Yes, I, <laughs> I, I, I did, yeah, because some people will, this might be their favourite car, but oh, okay. they won't use shittest in the description of it. But I, I think the one that deserves to probably to win the favourite shittest car has got to be an old shaped defender. Um, you know, we've we've been very rude about them, but. You, you you find it's hard not to love one. Um, I'm not sure I'd want to do a 12 hour journey in one particular. You, we love them because they're not shit. Well, that's that's your view, yeah. But uh, that would be my favourite shitter's car. But I've also put one here. I haven't owned one of these. My godfather owned one new, um, and it's the sort of car that I think a lot of people would look at who have been fortunate enough to drive nice cars and think, why would anyone want to own one of those? And that is a Fiat Panda 100 HP. Oh, um, I like very good. Yeah, <laughs> I think, but I can imagine a lot of people drive past those and think, oh, what is that? But actually, I think that's a cool little stealthy car to own. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't get um, it with clear glass, which was always uh, frustrating to me. Uh, Neil Clifford, what's your favorite shit car? You've got a well, few to choose from. <laughs> I'm asking you. the man. I'm asking the man that until recently had a Bristol fighter for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't choose not to own it. No, <laughs> no. Someone else chose that for me, which is another, <laughs> just another story on Jack and Ori. Moving on. Well, I think I think this is such a complex subject because favorite shit car is different to cool shit cars because there are many many cool shit cars in fact because i i think this sort of driving feel thing is all a bit bollocks a lot of cars that are cool are shit to drive in my view you know a citroen sm which i've owned too actually it's the most gorgeous car i'd own another if i could buy back the one i stupidly sold that a man won't now sell me it back but it's quite rubbish in truth and it's got a brake pedal as a button yeah so it's very unnerving it's basically like driving the portsmouth to ride hovercraft but it's such a cool thing it's like a lancia integrale frankly which people will, will 
hit me down with fire and flames for saying that. But I think it's different. A shit, your favorite shit car is there's I've got two, and I'll be brief. One that I own now, which is a classic Range Rover, not a Land Rover Defender, which we can argue for hours, and we've done that before. The classic Range Rover, I've got a 94 soft dash at the minute. Actually, it's super cool, but it's really shit. There's no leg room front and back. It's quite impressive to have no leg room. Yeah, front. the back in particular is bad. The back is terrible. It smells of, I don't know, cigars and farts. Even if you bought it new, it would smell of cigars and farts. It's 50% <laughs> chance of breaking down. It feels like the chassis is completely separate to everything else. Technically, it, feels, it is. It feels fragile. But the car that I've got, I've still got an itch for, which I think must be really shit, but I still want one, is a Citroen C6. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a great now, job. A Citroen C6, and I want, I don't even, I'm not really totally jammed up on the models, but I'd want the, I don't know, there'd be a French name for the top of the range one, the V6 manual, yeah. long wheelbase. The one there'll, you be one they, there'll be one they made for politicians that's a big yeah, one. The exactly, big yeah, exactly. Le Capitan or yeah, something. Yeah. Was... yeah, or President, like the butter. And that's, it, why all, that's why all French ministers would turn up late to meetings in a, in yes. a taxi because the, 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 their, their, their C6 would break down around the corner. And I still look for them on Auto Trader because they're not they're, they're a little too cool to be on collecting cars, funnily enough, and <laughs> or a little too shit. I'm not sure. And then you want the navy blue one, non-metallic, that was basically used by the French embassy. You know, just opposite Harvey Nichols, parked under that little arch, and it's got like I don't know. F A N one or France one F number F R A one yeah F R S it and it's got tan leather navy blue it's the long wheelbase one the V six maybe probably auto is better than manual yeah but I think a Citroen I'm not C6, sure there was a manual maybe not maybe not but I think that is a really great shit car a Citroen yeah that's C6. a a really good answer there I, I think I think you might have me but I think. For me, the concept, you, you describe beautifully the difference between favourite shit car and a cool shit car. We can all identify cars that are objectively shit or not very good at what they do, but they have a charm about them that means that they're they're cool or they're beautifully styled. Uh, and I, oh, that's quite obvious, but this is a more complex subject. Yes. I want to answer it two ways. First, from sort of with my own goggles on, but also as a what it's like as a journalist. So I've got several shit cars from my youth that I thought were great like parents had them and I was taught I was taught that the Jensen Interceptor was amazing because one of my friends dad had one he'd go on about how great it was until I was you know there was no internet it was only when I sort of started working and I was like oh Jensen Interceptor they're cool and everyone just went well they're terrible I had no idea that the car was a bit of a standing joke amongst people it really and it has been it's a charming thing but it fits into this category it's not a very good car but it but its reputation is for being cool and British and everything else I suppose in that for me in that category, I can see joy in, in a Triumph TR6. I'm not trying to wind up Mr. C here, but the TR6 is you know never came anything other than last in a group test because yes. it's a, I know I know sorry. I know I know I know. Just no, don't... But 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 they are you know it's not it's not a great effort. Mm. Uh, I I the, the, I suppose the shit car I can't find any redeeming qualities about it. It's the Triumph Stag. Whenever I see a Triumph Stag, I just feel sorry for the poor sod driving it. Yeah. Um, but um, and I suppose just... in the modern in the modern era, the car in my career that fitted that category was the Clio V6, which you know on paper was this amazing amalgam of Tom Walkinshaw's race organisation, Renault's bravery, and then when I went to the launch, there was a te I probably I've said this already, but there was a table of Renault people and a table of Tom Walkinshaw people, and the Tom Walkinshaw lot were going. Renault lot totally ruined this car. They're a bunch of wankers. And the Renault lot were going, <laughs> we should never give it to TWR. They don't know how to wipe their own arses. <laughs> and, and the car turned out to be an utter disaster. The second generation one was was better. But I'll tell you, that's what's my pen. There's a category of cars that, that when I was a journalist fitted this so perfectly and exposed the inner boy racer in all of us. And that was hot hatchbacks particularly hot hatchbacks, and maybe the lower end of the fast saloon categories. You'd go and do your group test, and you'd film them all, and you'd all sit down there and talk about steering feel and damping and all the stuff that we that Neil thinks is bollocks, but I think there might be a bit more to it than that. Um, and you'd and you'd come to, you'd reach your conclusion, particularly hot hatchbacks, and then 
if someone said which one you'd buy, you'd buy the one that was fastest against the clock because you because you just wanted the fastest one. You'd look at the numbers. The idea of, I can remember with a Punto GT, the turbo one, which objectively was not the best hot hatch out there. But when you drove them back to back, that thing could could, could dust everything else because it had so much torque and a turbocharged engine. And I, I just always wanted the fastest one. You could keep your steering wheel and everything else. Exactly. I would always buy the fastest car, even if it was the shittest. Yeah. Because back then I was just I just wanted the one that was quick against the clock. MG so, Metro Turbo. Exactly. Fiesta the Fiesta Turbo. Rather oh, Roger Bell yeah. wrote the most coruscating review of the yeah. Fiesta Turbo, I think it was. With the three spoke wheels. Yeah. But, yeah. but I remember driving one and thinking, this is so much faster. I don't care if it understeers. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I get that. Now, yeah. the next topic, again, these, these this is proposed by Neil Clifford, was just Vauxhall question mark. Yeah. Uh, so, Manish, how do you feel about that bridge near MI6? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, one of the joys of doing this podcast is that you do have to especially if you're me, read around things a little bit. And um, I love I love open question, Vauxhall question mark. Um, I didn't know that it started off as a steam engine company in Vauxhall. And then it made steam engines for boats. And then it made, moved to Luton and it became Vauxhall Ironworks. And then we started to get into um, to cars. I mean, I could go on, but... I. I'll tell you what I was very, very blown away by was the idea that this car had a car. It was the Prince Henry, a four litre, 75 horsepower car that was regarded mm. as yeah. the Bentley of its time. This is an aristocratic make. And, 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 and the history, the history of the automotive history of this company is incredible. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. And, and, and even further, I mean, I assumed obviously GM bought it in the 60s. That was my assumption. They bought Opel in the 60s, and they didn't. Way they earlier. They bought it after the First World War. So this is a company that's basically had American money put into it, along with Opel, in the interwar years. And, and I have to say, um, I discovered the Vauxhall 10-4. And I don't know, do you remember seeing the film Brazil? Yes. Terry well, Gilliam well, film Brazil. Yeah. I, I think in terms of sort of, you know, in, in that era, it was regarded as certainly one of the most beautifully designed movies ever. I mean, the production design in that is stunning from the typewriter at the beginning that, you know, that that the fly lands on that causes all the problems to Robert De Niro appearing to, you know, if you just look at it, it's got this very strange Art Nouveau mix with dystopian. I looked at the, the Vauxhall 10-4 and it is the, it's an object of absolute beauty. It is the Terry Gilliam interwar car that you'd have. And it, I, I just looked at the side of the bonnet. There are these two chrome, two chrome lines. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is. Just go with four straights in them on, on, on either side. But I even looked at, I think it was, a, was it the Victor that had integrated exhaust pipes yeah. into the rear, rear finish. So these, these things are just objects of such stunning design. And then to, to read about how effectively, I mean, it's, it's happening to us in life, I guess. Everybody's saying that um, that there are fewer and fewer companies that control more and more. And I guess Vauxhall, the, the kind of end chapters of their lives, it's the idea that it's part of a conglomerate, that it's gone from sort of nine or 10 or 12 base cars to what will be two, plus whatever vans they used to make. They They've created cars that really rebadged the Suzu's, all kinds of things. It's quite a sort of sad, it's quite a sad story for design, for, for individualism, for, for, you know, for everything that I think we hold as incredibly important in terms of cars and, and, and brands. I think it's a, a salutary story. It's, um, you know, anyway, so I'm going to get a Vauxhall 10.4. I'm going to find a beautiful one and restore it. It's There's just, always one at Vista. Is yeah. there? Yeah. yeah. Beautiful car. Yeah. Um, Neil Clifford, what do you think of Vauxhall? And I suppose I'll expand your own question for you, which is, do you care and should it exist? <clears throat> well, I always feel sad about it because it's a brand. It's a brand that I should have got. It probably was peak through my lifetime, or certainly my reference points. You know, it was. It was. 
it was a brand that I've never really been able to engage with. I've always struggled with it, whether it's, I don't know, I was always Heinz, I was always Ford, and I don't know, what would what would Boxall be Campbell's soup or something or Campbell's baked beans. I never really, I never really got it, even when it was down to should you get the the um what was the GTE thing? Astra GTE. Astra. 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 You know, I never, never wanted the, I mean, the coolest thing for me was, okay, you put Lotus Carlton to one side because that's always the reference point, but really it's a bloody Lotus, was mm. the Calibra. I sort of almost got the Calibra. Frankly, it's a better looking car than most Ferraris now. You know, it's actually quite a pretty bloody car, not too over-designed. You've got the square exhaust with the, was, the, was that the turbo or the 16 valve? The, 16, the, the, 16 valve red top got the squared mm, off type pipes. Yeah, got the, got yeah. the squared off exhaust. But it was somehow, whether it be just a weakness of marketing or something, I never really got it. I never really got it. And I always wanted to get it because it was British. It was made, you know, in bloody Luton. It employed a lot of people in the country. You wanted to get it. It was probably number two manufacturer probably through the 70s and 80s too it was wasn't it it was it was yeah. a very successful company i've never owned one i've never wanted one and i feel sad about that because really we should and it's something that it's never really clicked with me would you compare a carlton or a senator to a granada yeah for example yeah, yeah. but i always wanted the granada yeah and why i, I, I don't I, know I whether it thing. was a you know, I come from a sort of upper working class background, which certainly Ford was a bit aspirational, where Vauxhall sort of wasn't quite aspirational. It was yeah, the strange Ford. thing about that. The answer to that question is that in most areas, you can make a stronger argument for the Ford. But actually, a, a Senator 24 valve was so far beyond anything Ford made with the Granada badge. At the very end of the Granada, they put yeah. a Cosworth design 24 valve, 24 valve. in. But yeah. it, it still wasn't as good. The Senator was a real problem if you if you were young and trying to get away from a fed yes if you saw if you were being followed by one of those there wasn't any point because they, they, they had the square a, exhaust they could do a buck 50 all day long they were quite fast you didn't extraordinary yeah. car exactly yeah. yeah but you never wanted one i agree <laughs> I, yeah I, I thought i thought in a, they did a 24 valve estate that was a cool thing yes mm. well, did they, they do, did they do you... something like a sigma vxr which was like a shooting brake shape yeah, the the Sigma was a thing that it was sort of a hearse shaped thing. It yeah. was. It was kind of. Yeah. It was quite cool. I but yeah. you, I don't think you'd find yourself over the last ten years as a petrol head in a Vauxhall showroom, sort of not the last asking ten years. What's coming out next? No. What, uh, so, Chris Cooper, what are your thoughts on the Vauxhall? So I, I'm uh, very similar to Neil, really. I mean, I, I sort of have a uh, Vauxhall was a client of ours when I first set up my business. Crack it. That would have been a client of ours in the early two thousands. And um, I live even closer to the f factory or the, the head office, what was Griffin House. We went to Griffin House, which was not the original headquarters of Vauxhall and Luton, but kind of the big one. And at some point, there would have been five, 6,000 people working there. Yes. They, did, they did styling. They did, you know, original design engineering. They weren't just picking badges out of a box and sticking them on whatever came from Rüsselheim or the Opel factory in Belgium. I mean, they were, it, it felt like a real business. When I was there, even in the early 2000s, it still felt like it was a real business trying to find its its place in the world. Um, you can sort of see a peak. I had an uncle or sort of an in-law of an uncle in the mid-80s who ran the local Vauxhall Opal dealership. Yeah. And I remember going in and thinking, I'd have all of these. There was Mark One Astra GTE. Square, square one. Yeah, Mate of Mine at College had one. I, I used to run the Portsmouth Poly Motor Club. And a guy who'd, who'd had a mini club and with a big 1440 engine had left, gone to get his first job in industry, and with his first paycheck, bought a brand new Astra GTE. And he drove us all to the Birmingham Mo Show in 1986 or 87, something like that. I thought I'd dining on to heaven. It was just Recaro seats or the yeah, Recaro seats. Yeah, there's the Recaro. And it just, oh, I just thought this was just amazing. Um, Monza. GSI, oh, Manta GTE, definitely. They just all look Manta. G My brother had a Manta GTE. Brilliant looking car. Just such a lovely handling thing, and just lovely balance. Engine's a bit coarse, but it just. But like Neil says, they sort of never quite. You know, you see, you saw those Chevette HSs and HSRs, and you see a, 
you know, the Russell Brooks's one, um, Heat for Hire. Yeah. The color scheme you had on those HSs and HSRs, mid late 80s or mid 80s. They just look, just want them. Um, I suspect both the big, I mean, all of the big three American companies don't have a great track record in owning and allowing to flourish European car makers. Mm -hmm. They've kind of all cocked it up. And you're right. I mean, Vauxhall, Ford UK has always felt when we were growing up, we didn't really see Ford as an American business. We saw a British business. Yeah. Because the factories are all over the UK. Mm -hmm. And there was, you had the brochure, the Ford UK brochure you got at the motor show and it had Eagle House, Wally Way, Essex. And you thought that's a real place in the UK. It's a British company. And we thought Vauxhall was as well. But the Americans don't have a great track record, GM in particular, Saab, I mean, WTF. So it's never too much of a surprise that in the end, they didn't quite get it. And then the Calibra, we all knew the Calibra was a Cavalier. And yes, the Cavalier course. was a bit shit. Cavalier was hugely successful though, wasn't it? Uh, commercially, it was really successful. And the the original Cavalier, when there was an Opal Ascona yeah. at the same time, that which the Manta was based on, was a nice rear drive chassis, quite about live axle, but quite quite well balanced. By the late 80s, Vauxhall was, was actually killing Ford in the sales charts. You know, there was a period when it yeah. was number one. So I, I think we, I, I feel nostalgic about it, not just because they were a client years ago and, you know, the factory and the head office is sort of just over the hill that way. Um, but you know, it, it's what could have been. Yeah. But is it a weakness of marketing, or was it a weakness of was the cars? Uh, I, well, that's a good question. I I think they certainly didn't. They weren't short of money to spend on this stuff. But I think, and the Saab experience, GM latterly certainly didn't have a clue about what it was about Saab that was going to make it valuable or could make it valuable. Hence, you know the. There was a Cavalier under the Saab 900 eventually, and nobody was persuaded by that. So, uh, and Ford's... Do you, do, you remember, do you remember the Sniff Petrol's article by Bob Lutz saying, what is a Saab? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Should have put a gun I mean, on the front. It's, it's a conversation <laughs> all the time. We ought to some the time come back to how bad, why did Ford get it wrong with the Premier Automotive Group? Because there's some very clever people in there. Yeah. Very clever people from BMW and elsewhere. Um, and VW. So, yeah, so I, I feel nostalgic about it. And I, Griffin House is about to be knocked down. Is and it? they've moved the head office to a smaller building. As you go up the M1 north from Luton, on the right hand side, where all those new massive warehouses have been built, Junction 11A, if you look just to the right, you'll see a little Griffin flag. It's sort of a pretty nondescript 90s building. That is now the new headquarters of Vauxhall. And when you see pictures of Griffin House and Wentley, you think that kind of t sums up the whole story for me. It's uh, I can, I, I've never really paid that much attention to Vauxhall because when I started doing this for a living, it was already slightly on the wane. They were trying, and occasionally they'd come up with something quite interesting. But by then, you could tell GM had, had thought we're not going to throw money at this. Um, and I, but it, I don't have, of course, I'm not qualified to have an answer of why did Vauxhall fail if I did i'd be earning a load of money and be considered clever um but i do think that it's a lot of it was about timing there were times in its history when gm clearly invested a lot and the and the brand succeeded but towards the sort of end of the 90s early noughties the models that were released that they, they probably had more money for the marketing campaign than, than the way the cars were developed <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I, think, I think famously the first Corsa, they boasted about that there was more money for the supermodel campaigns in the magazines, you know, Christy Turlington, all that. That was more money on that than there was on the spent on the car. Um, but they they always they did fascinate me, and I, I am still seduced by the heritage. Like you give me yeah, a, yeah. an HS two thousand three hundred. There was one of those on the RAC rally that I did, and I, I spent more time photographing the box rear arches of that than I did any yeah. S. Yeah. Give me give me Jimmy or or Russell Brooks in one of those, and I'm, yeah. I'm all over it like a rash. And so I, I think the thing about sorry, but no, carry on, carry on. But I suppose the thing about Vauxhall that I I don't think there's a place for it now, really. I, I think this new Astra 
even if it's a reboot in something else, it's quite a clever piece of styling, actually. I, so, I sometimes think it could be a Honda or so. it's it's quite a good looking car and it's got nice light signatures at night. Yeah, so light that. lights mm. are, are quite attractive. And I hope they sell a few. But I suppose where I stand on Vauxhall is I'm not an advocate, I don't wear the t-shirt, but I will not stand by and watch people take the piss out of the brand unless they know about its history. That sounds so headmasterly, but they need to know a bit about, you know, stuff well before Lotus Cortinas, that this was a great brand and it deserves yeah. to be recognised as such. So yeah, when, people glib, when people glibly go, well, they're just shit, I go, no, 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 no. You, you need to go go and do some reading, boy, before you, or girl, yeah. before you yeah, say yeah. that. And I think that's the bit that you have to, you have to respect it. You can't just wipe it from history. What, what it does mm -hmm. now isn't, isn't as interesting. Mm -hmm. Lotus Carlton has its place among the most interesting cars ever made. I think I think the red top engine oh. is something that we should all celebrate. No, yeah. Vauxhall was selling you, you, us a red top with you know that was heavily tunable. It was effectively a racing engine for the road, whilst Ford was trying to sell you a Cologne V6 that was made of butter. So actually, you know, GM very good. was giving you some real value, and also. If I talk, if we talk about the most exciting motorsport from the late eighties to the to the mid nineties, mm. it's probably British touring cars. I don't have a picture of a Mondeo. I have a picture of John Cleland's name on the side of a Cavalier. I just that that's what I associate with touring cars. So yeah, I think it, uh, my my message is I don't really care about it so much now. But you have to respect what it stood for and what it what they achieved. Uh, mm. Edward, I uh, about twelve years ago. I was invited to go to Hereford for a on Friday night, I think, for a bit of red wine and probably some stew. And then about 6.30 on Saturday morning, we woke up, jumped into something I'd never got into before, which was a 3098. And we bumbled along, four of us in this thing, in about three degrees for about 25 minutes. Actually, a lovely road car, given its era, 1924, 1925, something like that. And uh, this was a lovely looking car, burgundy body. And then we pulled into a field. And um, for the next two days, we just drove it up the side of various different hills in the Hereford, oh, Herefordshire oh. countryside doing trialling. And uh, it was my first experience in a Vauxhall 3098. And to put that into context today, it's like going to an off-road event where you have things like Suzuki Jiminy's and Fiat um, Panda 4x4s, and then someone turns up in a Cullinan uh, to <laughs> also play the same game. You know, that was it was the same level. It was... A lightweight engine, four cylinder, so a smaller engine than the Bentleys of the era, but it was a lot more sporting, very quick, and uh, I, I think one of the most popular sporting cars of its day. They also made well, in yeah. in the modern era. Vauxhall was also responsible for for selling one of the most ridiculous cars I've driven in my lifetime, and I and I don't use the D word regularly but i think this wasn't far off being dangerous the vx220 oh. turbo oh. was oh. on a wet road <clears throat> watch out they were so fast and yeah. they were they bloody the number of those that got stacked so so they had a sense of humor as well or they had a, <laughs> or they had a, a legal department that was on the piss i don't know it's, but... a, it's a very well reviewed car that in by the yeah. magazines wasn't it it, it was, was, it was so lead. fast for, for the yeah. money cool okay so um, this 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 is one that slightly betrays what uh, Neil Clifford gets up to on weekday evenings. What's the what? What's your favourite leather interior? He didn't specify car. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so so Neil, what's your favourite uh, leather interior? Um, well, it's it's if anyone's ever this is a very niche thing to say owned a Rolls Royce Camargue. That has the loveliest leather interior you will ever get into in a car. You can own your 80s Bentleys, your 90s Bentleys, your Cullians, your, your new Rolls Royces, your Ghosts and your bloody, all of that stuff. You get in a Camargue, 
and I've got an analogy, but I won't say it. But imagine the softest piece of a of a of a of a, of a body, <laughs> male or female, a ma- male, male, shaven, male. not shaven. <laughs> um, even even this item from from an animal. Let's take a blue whale, and you've taken this little piece up a blue whale and stitched them all together. It's the loveliest, butteriest, softest, gorgeous leather. I think if you if you look it up, it says semi aniline. You know, they when they made the Camargue, they wanted to make it so much more impressive than the normal shadow or the normal um, whatever the two door bloody things called Corniche. Oh. And it was double the price almost of a yeah. standard Rolls Royce. So they went really way out there. So that for sure is the loveliest leather I've ever touched, which is on a. I'm Camargue. googling it at the moment. Uh, but do you, you like do you like the aesthetic of the Camargue, Neil? Yes, do you, I do. You do. I do. Yeah, I love I'm the back. interior. It's like from an aeroplane, the interior. Yeah. Yeah. I had one, and it bloody broke down three times in about six weeks. So I just, you know, I can't remember. I think it was Edward that said, as soon as a car breaks down, I give them three goes. I'm more, I'm more tolerant than, than... I think it was me that said that, and I give them two. I'm not, you're more tolerant than me. Three, yeah, yeah. and three in six weeks. It's, it's you know, one yeah. wife and the dog, and, you know, the drama that's created by a breakdown. You have three, and it's out, really. Um, uh, it's, Edward Lovett's it's favourite awesome leather interior. It's never been, it, the car had never been driven, so it was just the fault of the previous owners, not mine, or even the guy I bought it off. Anyway, Rolls-Royce Camargue. There you go. <laughs> uh, uh, no... no. Love it. Back in uh, back in my days working at BMW Bristol, where right I think my I... babbers, <laughs> right my babbers, um, <laughs> we uh, one mm. one of the fun jobs of being working in the sales team is specking the showroom cars oh, to have on display. Great job! You and... must have been an absolute disaster with your taste. <laughs> Fantastic! <laughs> and. I used to love specking E46 M3s in individual paints with individual Nappa leather. And, you know, the new Nappa leather on a 2004, 2005 E46 M3, they had all sorts of wonderful colours, but it smelt good. It was soft and silky and it was everywhere. Um, Yeah. So that that's my memory of uh, of of leather of those days. I need cactus. I think was the color I liked. Cactus. Cactus. Was that a green, green one? It was. Green. Yeah, like yeah, light, light green leather. Yeah. Wow. Uh, uh, Chris Cooper. Leather. That interior. reminds me of that era when I, I was racing caterums in Europe in the Euro Cup, and there's a guy who at the time had been big in historic racing when historic was wasn't as big nowhere near as big as it is now. Simon Crompton, who used to be the MD of L and C, the BMW dealer down in Kent. Yeah. Originally an Alpina dealer before Sitness had it. So they had their main one was Tunbridge Wells, but they had Croydon, Banstead, a few other places. And it would have been summer 04, so peak E46 M3. And every race we went to, he had a different E46 M3 convertible. Nice. It's most extraordinary combinations of leather and over everything. Because he just went berserk like you. It was just... Did, did, did he have the famous Laguna with Laguna? That was always my favourite. Yeah. Laguna, yeah. Laguna, Laguna with Laguna oh, Seiko. That was challenging. Yeah, it was it's challenging. a good colour, that Laguna yeah. Seiko, though. Yeah. Um, but I, I sort of... I haven't owned a Rolls Royce Command. That I know it'll come as a shock to everybody. But but I was at the London Motor Show as a very young small boy, feeling very nervous on the Rolls Royce stand when the Command was launched. Crikey. And I thought I must have how was it then? Eight or something. It was nice, seventy six. Seventy six, yeah. Seventy six. Yeah. Um and it was I just thought the it was First a spaceship. It must have been older than that, actually. A spaceship. It looked fine at the time. Then it went off, but now I think it's wonderful. You look at see, oh, you see one now, and you think, oh, that's just amazing. So because I haven't owned one of those, and it wasn't allowed inside with my little sticky little stubby fingers in the 976 motor show stand at Earl's Court, um, L322 Range Rover with nice everything leather. in it. Mm. You could get it with the leather roof lining. 
the autobiography oh, yes, very nice, yeah. had a leather roof lining. I think probably the 405 as well. But I think the architecture and the general layout of the 322 mm. is nicer than the 405. Lots of big yeah. rotary rubberized dials. To take. And yeah. just sort of, arch, you know, those, those sort of vertical plinths or bits of wood, wood that yeah. went through nice. the centre dash. I mean, they make the 460. Jerry? Yeah. 322. Not a, fingerprint, it's not a fingerprint inside. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that idea. you can get those now. If you wanted, I mean, there are very few unmolested. I've been looking at them all over Christmas, thinking I want a clear glass unmolested, something under 90,000 miles if possible. <clears throat> it's hard Elf. to find. It's quite hard to find. But so, someone's got my green clear glass with tobacco interior V8. <laughs> Supercharged facelift one. Why did I sell that? Oh. Bonkers. Did that have the the sort of like the sort of the spline spoke wheels? It had it had those, and it had a set of winters as well. Don't ask why did I? And it done thirty thousand miles. Oh, somebody's oh. uh, enjoying that now. I know. Uh, Manish, what's your favourite other interior? Um, I don't know whether it's series two or series three. I can't remember. But um, a friend's dad had a Daimler Double Six Phantom Plaid. Nice. I don't, I don't know if it was a van and plot. It was definitely a double six. And the leather interior in that yeah. was mind blowing. And, and the th the clever thing about that car, remember, it it's not as it's not like you know, like your Berlinetta box's beautiful signature Daytona seats. There's something sort of so specific about it. There's something so there's something so sort of seventies sofa about yeah, the yeah. way that the the Daimler's leather works. It it. it it's it's it doesn't seem specific to it. It's just so insanely comfortable, and the way the walnut sets off the leather, and it's, it's just everything about it was just so meticulous. The series Stop one is the it. one really. They're lovely. It really, yeah. Beautiful. The series beautiful. one is a, is the is the Maybe one. Series one, series. Yeah. One. Yeah. We just sell one of those on collecting cars, but it's still yeah, you did. Yeah. Jag XJ12. Yeah, yeah done, a, done a done a few miles. Um, yeah, the, the leather interior thing is interesting. I don't, I don't really like leather seats most of the time. I prefer a uh, sort of corduroy finish or a cloth seat. But there was something very, as a young kid, we never, my parents never had leather seats. So when you get in a car with leather seats, there was this smell of it's expensive. It would really mm. hit you. You'd think, blimey, yeah. this is a bit exotic. Uh, you know, I'm not a vegetarian, but I, I, sort of, I like to think I've got some ethics around that sort of thing. So the idea of thinking that a dead animal smells good is a bit odd, but they do. You know, just the car. The car does smell great, and it is a. It's a really. It's an amazing. It's an amazing product that we've tried to replace, but there isn't really a replacement for it, in the way that we use it. Um, so personally, I, I'm not that into leather interiors, but the, the 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 two that really sort of stand out for me are one, Renault very kindly in 2004 let me have a, a Renault Clio V6 gen, second generation car as a long termer. And re normally these things, you just get told you can have one. But Renault very kindly said, you can spec it if you want. Ooh. I said, well, surely you can't really spec these things. And they said, no, you can. There's a few options. And they said, the one thing we're doing, but we don't want to shout about it, is we're doing a special leather interior package. That means that actually the door cards are in leather. It's, you know, it's a Clio dash. But the whole you can do the whole rear deck where the engine bay is inside the car in leather as well and around the sides. Wow. They said, and they said it's a nightmare to do. No one's picked it up as an option in the UK, really. But we wouldn't mind having one out there that that has this. So do you mind, go on, go for it. I went, OK. So the car was made in Diet, then shipped to Monaco, where some outfit did this leather, beautiful leather interior. And it was a really high quality leather. And they shipped it back. And that car is somewhere in, it, and some owner will have it, or is known to be a bit special because it's got this gold paintwork with, it's, not, it's got black paint but with gold flake in it. And yes, leather interior. And I always remember the leather would get a bit warm when the engine got warm and the whole car smelled. It's the most leathery smelling car I've ever been in. <laughs> and it did smell expensive. So I did. I quite like that. But I'm a bit biased because I've just spent Christmas over the you know, last two weeks in a Bentley Flying Spur. For me, Neil can dismiss you can keep your Bentleys. But for me, it's all about Bentley interiors. I'm sorry. They yeah, just right have, yeah, they have the best hides. Once you've been to the factory and seen the respect and the care and the love they put into these interiors, I just love them. I, I, I think a Mulsan interior is unlike anything else. The others, yeah. they try. Some of them are a bit more funky and technical, but there's something about sitting in a big Benta's seat and yeah. just around you. And the only time I get probably more excited by an interior 
and that is an addict's word, is when I sit, and this comes back to what Edward was saying, when I sit in a car that should normally have not leather, but there's someone's option insane levels of leather like in a Porsche when you see someone that's gone for the air vent slap yeah. and you know that that's about four grand yeah you, and then you start looking around going oh my god that's leather as well what isn't leather I do I don't want, I don't want that car but I do look at it and think that's ridiculous but yeah. I, I find it quite amusing I suppose um Right, yeah. here we go then. This is, this is something that I don't buy into whatsoever, so I'll sit here with my cynical hat on and give you a glib answer. What are our 2024 cars oh. and hopes? Uh, I'm going to start with Edward Lovett, who's going to say that he wants collecting cars to sell 20 million cars so we can <laughs> yeah. retire to a private island somewhere off Phuket. Um, <laughs> well, as you've just finished that with uh, talking about leather, I put the first thing I've put is Bentley ownership i think there needs to be a bentley appearing in one's life over over the course of 2024 i don't know if it'll be an old shitter or, yeah. or, or or it'll be something someone lends me um but yeah, yeah there's some bentley ownership in my life definitely um yeah. Given the weather and the speed the clouds are moving out here, I'm quite looking forward to a bit of spring weather already. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> already. Um, and then Chris and I are off to New Zealand on the uh, 23rd of um, January. And we are going to be doing an event there and an event in Australia on the 4th. So I'm very looking forward to engaging in our Southern Hemisphere community. That's 2024, or the first part of it anyway. Uh, Manage Pandy. The thing that most matters to me this year is um, getting our beautiful Ferrari project off the ground. <laughs> Being, uh, seeing Chris Cooper driving, I'm sorry, sorry. I'll, no, I'm coming. Yeah, no, I'm coming. You're coming. To, I think we're all going. But I think seeing, seeing Chris Harris and Luca Montezemolo. Oh, yes. Lap Italy in a Ferrari talking about how that brand was built and why everybody fell in love with it, at least for a period of time, and getting some really good inside stories on the Schumacher era and what it took to make that happen. And does Kimmy actually eat food or does he just drink all the time in and out of it? I mean, we, we want to see that made. That's, yeah. my, that's my absolute obsession for this year. I'm up for it. Um, so it'll be amazing. It'll, it'll be amazing. Uh, Chris Cooper. So um, just a codicil on 2023. So I think most people have seen by now that uh, our sport was delighted to see that Ron Dennis is now Sir Ron Dennis. Congratulations, Ron and family and everybody. Absolute involved. card carrying legend. Don't he's extraordinary. read all negative stories. Go and look at what he's done. Yeah, he uh, it, part of his um, uh, part of his uh, honour was for his more recent, clearly big charitable activities, um, the Podium Analytics, this charity that he chairs, which is about helping young people who have been injured in sport or preventing injury sport. Wonderful. Um, I've had. Well, can, I have, can I have one thing there as well? If anyone here knows Ron or is connected to Ron, please can you tell him that we love Ron and we want to do, and I want to do a podcast with him. So okay, I will get Ron I'll pass that on. I'll yeah. send him a text now. Yeah, I'll pass that <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, he's just he's oh, just no. here. He's just here, and I'll just talk to him. <laughs> uh, and also, Does Christian Warner for CBE. I mean, seriously. Can you say, dear Ronald, we want to get you on our podcast. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we might need three days. Sorry, Chris. Um, so Christian Horner got a CB and also uh, Duke of Richmond, Charles March, also got a CB. So we're, we're delighted for all of those. So my 24 goals are about, um, I want to get, I think everyone should go and enjoy the local car show, not these car meets. That's a completely yeah. different thing. So on Boxing Day near where I actually sort of between where and Neil and I live at Sarrett Green, mm. there was just a Boxing Day car meet. People brought along. I took along our disco our old Defender. One of the blokes in the farm took Lynn's TR6. Uh, one of the blokes in the farm took their old Massey Ferguson. He's got a 35 S, which is like the Turbo S version of what I've got. I was really upset. So go and look, go and enjoy a local car show. It would be great ambition for everybody. Two other things. 
I, I'd love to, it won't be on this year, but the rally with no name, Monkey, which you yeah. Yeah, fabulously well, and spectacularly won by six tenths of a second. If you yeah, haven't yeah. watched the film, go, it's a wonderful film. Monkey is quite impressive. Um, two things I think we should do together. I think we should do, we should ask our viewers and listeners to provide us with a design for a soapbox and then we should enter it in a race. The other thing I think we should do <laughs> is lawnmower racing. Um, it's a twelve-hour twelve-hour lawnmower race. Are you secretly, are you secretly launching a chiropractic business that you want to <laughs> that you want to yeah. somehow boost sales to? Because if you not see- now, then never. If not now, then never. Um, a twelve-hour th- lawnmower race. Well, there's oh. shorter ones, but there's a twelve-hour one in August. It goes overnight in August. Um, it would have to be a group, I think it's group three or class three lawnmower. So it's the it's a sit-on, but it's not like the big tractor one. It's sit-on, but it's like look a little a go-kart with a they take the, the blades off. Of. Obviously, yeah. Um Sorry, so I think we should do Let's if somebody would like to submit a design for a soapbox to us, we'll buy the bits and then we'll draw lots for who's going to do gravity racing. So those are my ambitions of the year. I know some fine MRI scanners in London. We're all good. <laughs> <laughs> does one does one have a lawnmower that we could enter? Uh, I've got, I've got probably an old, an old wheel horse that shit itself. Yeah, we've got one round. I had to come to something at the weekend. When you see the red, the Red Bull soapbox thing, people use bicycle tires, which don't work on a four wheel vehicle because bicycle tires work because they distribute the load. You know through the axis of the of the of the t- cycle tire if you put yeah. four cycle tires on a vehicle they go doesn't work but a narrow so if somebody's going to submit a design to us of a soapbox disc wheels that are non-spoke disc wheels probably quite a big diameter narrow gauge lower rolling resistance bit of centrifugal stability but i'll leave the engineers and our audience to tell us what fast looks like it sounds like an opportunity for collecting lawnmowers.com. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Neil Clifford, what are your goals for 2024? Well, look, I, I, I love lists and I, I, I adore January because it's, it's an ability to reinvent yourself and get that horrible old skin off and New Year and all that. I don't like December. I don't like Christmas. Um, so January for me is a very busy, hectic time around – writing lists of things that I want to do, personal work, health, cars, any old shit. I've got lists for everything in my phone. It's magic. I'm going to read a couple of them out. I've got about 20 in my car goals 2024 list. I'm not going to read all of them because it'd be very boring. But um, to drive around, actually, most of them are transferred from fucking 2023 as well, which is really the annoying thing about lists <laughs> because – Unfortunately, when you know you have all these lovely cars, means you actually bloody work a lot, which means you can't actually do the shit you want to do with the cars. It's one of life's big dilemmas, which I'd love to share in more detail about that challenge. Anyway, drive around the whole circumference of Italy yeah. with my wife. Yeah. That's been there since about 2012. That one on the list. <laughs> but I will do that. I will do that at some point. Hopefully, in a what, Neil? In a what? In 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 a car that's made also in Italy, northern Italy, I suggest I would suggest, um, because then of course you're treated lovely and you won't get speeding tickets and everyone's charming to you. Um, I want to do the tour auto. I've got I've got th- I've got three things. I've actually managed to do one of them, which was the um, which was the Targa Florio. So I want to do Mili Milia, and I want to do tour auto. And I did the Targa Florio, thank God, just about with my lovely friends. And so um, Tor Auto and Mili Milia is going to be on this list, hopefully, until I take them off the list, as opposed to dying when they're still on the list. Um, I want to go to Japan and I want to buy a car in Japan. I adore Japan. Anyone that doesn't like Japan, I probably don't like you. I think Japan, America, and Italy are the only three places really that you can go on holiday, and they're just magic. I want to fly to Tokyo, buy an MX-5, and just drive around all the cool little beaches, mountains, mega little crazy towns. Um, So Japan is a thing. I want to improve my driving skills. Um, What else have I got here? 
I want to go to the Dolomites Ooh, and around yeah, with my Italian charming lovely friends with their yeah. beautifully trimmed hair and navy blue outfits in the Dolomites. So that's about four of the 20 things I want to do. But write lists, writing lists. Yeah, lists are good. Lists are yeah. good. Lists are good. So uh, you I've um, reinforced that one, eh? So I, I've I'm not really into uh, I, I, the two phrases that I really am allergic to are dry January and mm -hmm. um, uh, and I'm, I'm not interested. If you don't want to drink, keep it yourself. Uh, and and also um, New Year's resolutions. Just that's just <laughs> bollocks. So I don't really get it anyhow. <laughs> but I quite like the idea. So car goals are quite low. So I'm with Edward. I'm going to own a Bentley this year. Um, and, uh, and uh, but the the way I'll the way I'll fund it will keep everyone let's say highly amused. Um, You're going to finally um, become that armed robber we knew you were. Yeah, <laughs> potentially. Uh, the uh, I want to drive my rally cars more this year because my 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 performance on the RAC wasn't great and I, I had a very difficult week and the, uh, it wasn't good and I think um, I've got unfinished business with rallying. Uh, I want to go to the Nurburgring again because I haven't yeah. been for years. And I'd like to just go on a track day, just go with some friends. So uh, and yeah, if, if anyone, anyone of the addicts wanted, if the yeah. addicts wanted to come along, we'll show you how, how you go around there. We'll go and drink some beer and eat some sausages. Lovely. Um, uh, uh, on a non-car non rated thing, I've got a really shit old speedboat that everyone laughs at because it's got a silly name. And it's made of plastic, but when I'm out on, on the water with my kids skiing and wakeboarding, I, I, it's one of the happiest times of my life. I didn't use it last year, so I want to get that out in the water. Mm, um, nice. I want to do the Mortal to Ori again with Chris Wilson, who's a big part of collecting cars, and, and, and I had a great time doing that. We're unfinished business. Uh, I want to work with Neil Carey more because he's my uh, man-husband who I work with a lot. He's wonderful. Um, I want to go to the Isle of Man TT again, which I'm definitely about to book my tickets because yeah. it's one of the best things I've ever done. Um, and I want to do as much as I can with the addicts as possible this year, uh, both professionally and uh, non-professionally. So th that I want to do as much as possible. And I want to make some great content that makes me feel proud. Uh, but then I, that's not about January. That I should be thinking that every day of the week and every week of the year, shouldn't I? Okay. So I think um, on that note, let's move on to some music. And able to go, well, I didn't know we were doing music. Two-car garage. Yeah, Two-car garage. Oh shit! Two car garage. Right, yeah. Okay. But this, so this time, actually, there's no big narrative that I have to read out, which is quite good for me. But there I didn't is know a we're uh, doing music. Oh <laughs> Jesus! Uh, I um, because because we want to present ourselves as being, you know, speaking to the, the ordinary man and woman. We're going to go for something that's a bit more parsimonious. So you've got twenty grand to spend on two cars. That's it. And as Chris Cooper quite brilliantly said, we can worry about the running costs in February. That's all you need to know, okay? So that opens it up a bit to the dance floor. So, Edward Lover, off you go. Okay, so... I've decided to buy, because I've never owned one, a TVR, because I think we need a bit of open-top yeah. V8. Uh, and... Obviously, we've got 20 grand here, and I'm going to need some change for number two. So it's going to have to be a Chimera. Is that right? Chris? Yeah, Chimera. Yeah. Chimera. Yeah. Chimera. Yeah. And they did a four yeah. litre, four litre or a four. Yeah, we have one. Four, we, had a four, we had a four litre, 240 yeah. horsepower one. Yeah. Clearly, I don't need to worry about whether it works or the running costs, but I've bought fine. One of those. And yeah. I've, I have been onto a competitor's website to get some inspiration for this. And the other car that I found is a an original first generation KNS manual. Oh, manual! That's a and car. I, and I'm going to pimp it up and turn it into a Trans Siberia spec, <laughs> yeah. which is kind of a. I think they got all the Porsche dealers in the UK this uh, in 2023 to do to find a KN and turn them into Trans um, Siberia Expresses, and then they went up to the place that. Tuttle goes up to in Wales. What's the bowl called? Walters up there? Arena. Walters Arena. I think they were they were doing having some fun up there. So that's my two car garage: a manual V8 S KN nice. and a four point two liter Chimera. That's nice. Neil Clifford. Neil Clifford. Right. How much have we got? Twenty, 20 grand. grand. Twenty, 20 grand. grand. Two um, cars. Okay. I'm going man of the people. Uh, Ford Mondeo ST220 V6, right? 
And you'll be able to yeah. go and nick one of these. A guy's been polishing it from bloody day one. He's got the mirrors underneath the front of the engine when he takes it to the shows. It's got 30,000 miles from new original plates, all the service history. In fact, he was a mechanic at the Ford dealership, so he nicked all the stuff when he got made redundant. He's been servicing it for the last 20 years in his garage. Absolutely fantastic thing. And no one would ever look at it, but it's a cool car, that. It's like seven grand, right? And then you want something sporty. You know it's going to break down, but you don't really care. What are you going to buy? It's got to be an Alfa Romeo. You're going to buy You're going to buy an Alfa Julia, maybe the Cup if you can, you know, the V6 one, 93, 94. Hopefully that lovely turquoise blue with the tan, Um those lovely leather seats, actually beautiful. Uh, frankly, it's an Alpha S said, but just better made because an S said shit and you know, all the bloody panels are wonky. And that's 10 grand. So you've got three grand left for servicing and or basically taking your partner and drive around Italy <laughs> in the Alpha. Uh, Manage, Manage, 20 grand, two cars. There's a flash card. Can you see them? Yep. Oh, oh. Ooh. S4, oh, XR3i and an X19. Oh, exactly. That's yes. what I'm getting. When, when I was a kid, there was a big one on the XR3i. And I I always liked the hard top more than the convertible. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Uh, controversial. But those two, they said it was the car of the brain surgeon. That's what they said. A brain surgeon would buy that car. But, I, you know, I thought I, I, I completely bought into that. My friend Dan bought uh, uh, an X19. And it, he took me to university in it. My first day at university with my several suitcases, posters, and all the rest of it was in a black X19. And we had to take that bit off because um, it doesn't nice. have much luggage space. I think they're great cars. The um, XR3i, 8,600 pounds. And the uh, X19, 11,300 pounds. I have 100 pounds left over for those university pints. That's a toppy X19. That is the best one in the country. In the country. Um, so, uh, Chris Cooper. I got three. Well, I had two. Oh, God. Uh, I had two, but I got a bonus one. I'll come to it right at the end. It's a really good one. I also had a TBR. So, I kind of I parked that because I had a backup, obviously. So, my first main two were in 2002 E46 330 cab, 63,000 miles, 7 car. Nice car, proper car. All these are proper cars for 20 grand. Um, then the 2009. Yeah. yeah. So I, I find blue over, it was blue over black. I'm trying to find blue over cream, but blue over black. No, still nice. 2009 C63 wagon, 72,000 miles, 13 grand. So that's your 20. But because the third one is such a steal, Jack, one of the guys on the farm, Jack is the guy who was in the winning team of the fast and the farmerish. And yesterday I noticed in the farm there was a 2004 R53 Mini Cooper S. It's got 75,000 miles. It's grey with the chili pack. Yeah. Got to have Ooh. the chili pack. Bluetooth? Yeah. Uh, didn't check that. I think it has. Yeah, it's got a mobile. It must have Bluetooth. It's got a mobile on it. Um, Black roof, that sort of light grey metallic, clear, chili pack wheels. One thousand pounds he paid yes. for it. That's such a lot of car for the money. They were great. They are one fifty three. A thousand pounds. I said to him, "I'll give you fifteen hundred for it." He said, "No, no, it's worth a lot more than that." So, uh, twenty one thousand. But R fifty three Mini Cooper S. Yeah, seventy five thousand miles. Twenty years old. Chili pack, clear glass, black roof, grey. Thousand pounds. That's a January and with, bargain. And without realizing it, but somewhat inevitably, Chris Cooper has just invented the three car garage on cleansing addicts. So, <laughs> Forty one thousand pounds. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, there's some re it's a really really good group of cars that. But of course, you're both. Well, all of you are wrong. Um, <laughs> so it's it's um it's a it's a very leggy, water damaged Cat N B7 RS4 Avant. Uh, and it's uh, and just because Chris Cooper's wrong, uh, it's an AX GT. 
And if you had both of those, I didn't you would say it was wrong. <laughs> you would be the happiest it. little. You'd be the happiest little French Iranian in the southwest because uh, they are just I, I, honestly. When I see those two cars written down on paper, they make me more excited than just about all the yeah. new shite that I drive. Yeah. I think they're great. So, uh, somewhat prematurely, I said let's do some music about ten minutes ago, but now let's do some music. Um, we'll start off with uh, Edward Lovett, who will say, "I didn't know we we're doing music this week." Uh, what love is Zimmer ninety? Oh. It'll go. You can listen to it afterwards. Zimmer, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Manish Pandey. I went to see the Ferrari movie. I think we've all seen the Ferrari movie. Um, I wrote a script which was basically um, not that dissimilar in terms of its period. I wrote fifty seven, fifty eight, and this Ferrari movie has the death of Castellotti. And the way it was realized by Michael Mann was that people were at church, people were doing their jobs, and they could hear Castellotti going for a, for a lap time, and there was some CGI and, and all the rest of it, all the stuff that I hate. And the way that I'd written it was a slow motion scene, and I'd, I'd had him dying at dawn, so I took a little bit of poetic license. And I had this beautiful red, the Ferrari, the, the prototipo that he went with one chrome body panel that it just hadn't been finished. So you imagine this thing at dawn and it had been wet the night before. So the sun's just coming up and you see this car's a silhouette and I slowed time down. And what happened is he was going out with, um, what was her name? Not Yama Breshi. He was going out with uh, the singer. Anyway, he was going out with the singer. And I imagined her singing this piece of music. It's from the opera Ronaldo by Handel and it's Lascia Chiopianga. Let me cry. So she's singing. Casalotti's driving. Casalotti has his accident. And she's holding a rose in her hand. And the rose explodes. Lots and lots of red petals. And that's the death of Castellotti. And that's what this piece of music will always be. And that's by Handel. By Handel. Last year, listen to it by Cecilia Bartoli. That's the best version. So beautiful. Right, no doubt. Uh, Neil Clifford. I've been mainly listening to jazz over the Christmas <laughs> period. Yes. It's interesting. Uh, In Bristol, you really watch jazz. You don't tend to listen to it. Well, I would recommend if you're ever going to get pneumonia, get it on Christmas Eve because you can have a nice long period of relaxation between having to. Um, get better and go back to work and listen to jazz in the middle. And I would recommend, um, I was going to recommend an album, but obviously can't put an album on there. So um, John Coltrane, mm -hmm. Love Supreme and part four, which is Psalm, which is very, very good. I'd recommend that. So put that on there, please. Rick, can you repeat it? Yeah. So that Rob Coltrane. It's, it's John Coltrane. Oh, John Coltrane. The album, the album's a Love Supreme and it's the part four. There's four parts to the album. Um, on vinyl, of course, I'm listening to, so you have to get up and let's turn it over for part three and four, which is oh, all yeah. very sophisticated and lovely. Which is these days, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chris Cooper. Um, so I was a bit worried about, we all were a bit worried about Neil. So I had a, a little picture book sent over to Neil on Christmas Eve, one of the books I showed you. last time, actually. Um, so uh, we're all glad you're peak of fitness again. I am. Um, so, yeah. Um, I can't really follow Manage, and um, particularly because um, it's shitting down outside. It's January, and you just need a bit of a rah to get going. So I picked Thunderstruck ACDC. Oh, good. Rah! <laughs> um, I've had a much as I said, I, I find it difficult when people are in the car and they distract my inner car observations and the fact that I'm always I don't want interruptions. I've, been, I've spent a lot of time in car with my children, and I do love that. And, and actually, when you're in the car with the children, sometimes you want to just play music that you feel they should know about, so you feel it's an educational process. Sometimes we just listen to Cabin Pressure on a loop because it's the funniest, best thing I've best. ever heard on radio. But sometimes you want a song that just makes you laugh. Uh, and for me, there's no more joyous song than Johnny Cash's Boy Named Sue. Oh, brilliant. We, we always listen to it together, and we just cry with laughter at how clever it is and how just it's, it's gorgeous. So, boy named Sue is a great thing to listen to with your kids. Mm. Uh, and that brings. Before we go, could we just have a moment silence to 
a man that I I wish I'd got to know him better, but I knew him a little bit. And I, I had the best conversation with him in Abu Dhabi about what it is to build a team and what it is to really develop young drivers. And that was Gilles de Ferran. Yeah. yeah. Just an amazing human being, amazing human being. And if you ever met Gilles, he, um, he was a Jaguar to most people's leopards. He was just a little bit bigger, just a little bit more powerful, but he had the best smile. And I think one thing everybody would say about Gilles is that his sincerity really, really didn't care what you did. But you could be Bernie or you could be, you know, Chase Carey or you could be a mechanic. He'd speak to you in exactly the same way. And um, I, very, very rarely have I met someone who I just, his charm, his intellect and his strength just impressed me so much. So little tiny thought to Gilles de Ferrand. I didn't, I, I've never met him, but obviously he, what the, the, the sort of eulogies that have come out on social media and, and in the publications are, you know, yeah. they, are, they have to be sincere. People can't be that insincere. Yeah. But I, I, I only saw him compete once. And actually I, I wanted to write about it, but then I thought to myself, Is it, am I trying to make myself look like I know the bloke? And I know I stopped and I didn't. So I've, I, I'm embarrassed, but I, I, I went to Rockingham when they had the IndyCar race. And, and they, I went for the, there was a test and, and qualifying day. And we were, we were, I think the media were all invited to go. So we all went along to this new facility. And uh, the, the cars only run fast for one lap because there was a drainage issue and they couldn't drive. And they sent the drive down. And I remember seeing him, he was the only car that we saw go into turn one absolutely with the afterburners lit at Rockingham. And I'd never seen a car on a kind of off square overly thing in my life. And I think all of us had a bit of a kind of, it's just shit F1 and ovals mean nothing. But he si in one corner, he silenced most of the British motorsport <laughs> and motoring media. Because I remember, I've never heard more, and it was men then, I've never heard more men in a room go, fuck me. Yeah. More, so everyone just said exactly the same thing. We all went, fuck me as it went through turn one and then the flags came out and we never saw another we didn't see anything else that day just one corner and it was his car i Amazing. didn't realize you were there oh. i was at that race that was the first of the two champ car races held at rockingham and there was a weeper just before turn one yeah because it was newly built and i was there because a lot of my mates worked for reynard at the time quite coincidentally so we had some seats just on the exit of turn one and he won that race right at the end from Kenny Brack. Yeah. And uh, he was just so super brave. And it's the first and only super speedway trioval, whatever you call it, I'd ever seen. I couldn't believe how brave and extraordinary they were. It was just so to have been there to see Gilles win that 2001 champ car, William champ car at the time at Rocky and Wonderful. So, yeah, no, well said, Manish, here, here. Uh, okay, that ends... Uh today's lesson and we'll see you next week for episode 48 bye bye see you later